This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, you can start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their amazing all-in-one platform through the link below and more on them in just a bit. The tragedy of the Titanic is well known today. Thought to be an unsinkable titan, she was destroyed by an iceberg and brought down in the Atlantic Ocean. But what's less well known is that the Titanic had a twin sister, the RMS Olympic. The two were built side by side, but thankfully the Olympic didn't share its sister's fate. So let's take a closer look at the vessel that was, for 20 years, the largest passenger ship in the world. In the late 1800s, the shipping company White Star Line was looking to expand its fleet. Its 29 ships were mostly used to transport cargo between the UK and Australia, and profits were booming, especially after gold was found in Australia. One of the founders of White Star Line, Henry Wilson, thought that the best way to build up profits was to build bigger and bigger ships, the types that generate press coverage in the newspapers and attract wealthy clients. The first of this kind were the Oceanic class, which transported passengers across the Atlantic, generally between Liverpool and New York. These ships were often packed with hundreds of European immigrants looking to start a new life in North America, and they brought White Star Line a lot of good business for decades. At the turn of the century, however, the company was running into financial trouble again. Some failed cargo routes through the Suez Canal left the company with some debt, and another one of their passenger ships sank near Nova Scotia, killing 535 people. White Star Line needed something spectacular to bring them back into the competition, and the Olympic class was born. The Olympic class was to have three ships, the Titanic, the Britannica, and the Olympic. Yes, the Olympic was in the Olympic class, very creative, you often see this with ships. The three ships were similar in design, but the Titanic and the Olympic were almost identical to each other. Some estimated that the Olympic was only three inches shorter, or just seven centimeters. The Olympic was built in Belfast by the construction company Harland & Wolfe, who put their best designers in charge of the project. In 1908, managers at White Star Line approved the designs, and it was decided that the Olympic would begin construction a few months ahead of the Titanic to not overwhelm the shipbuilders. Two years later, in 1910, the Olympic was finished, and the footage of her being launched into the Atlantic survives to this day. After this ceremonial launch, the ship was pulled back onto the shore for the hull to be painted a solid black. The length of the Olympic was 882 feet, or 269 meters. It pushed through the water with three large bronze propellers at the back of the ship. Two of them had three blades, and the central four-bladed propeller was powered by a new steam engine. To power the engines on these propellers, the ship burned through 650 tons of coal every single day. The smoke from this was then vented through four large smokestacks. The whole ship weighed over 52,000 tons and had nine separate decks, one for the crew and eight for the passengers. The passenger decks were divided into first, second, and third class. A traveler staying in third class would sleep in a large room shared with up to 10 other people and have access to a smoking area, dining room, and common lounge. Second class was accommodated in private cabins and shared a library, a lavish dining hall with other members on the same deck. Members of second class could also travel between the decks using an elevator, something unavailable to third class. But the real attraction, of course, was the first class. Passengers with a first class ticket were given private, expensive rooms to stay in, many of which even had private bathrooms. Three separate elevators took the guests between their rooms, several restaurants, a gymnasium, a swimming pool, a sauna, a cafe decorated with real palm trees, and the elaborately carved grand staircase. It was everything you dreamt of when you imagined the newest fanciest superliner of the time. All right, we'll get back to our video in just a quick minute, but first, here's a quick word from today's video sponsor, Squarespace. Now, more than ever, people are getting creative with their time. They're reaching deep into that savings account to start a new business or launch a new politics blog to share their unpopular opinions with friends and neighbors. The world is yours and Squarespace is the platform to use when you're ready to get started on the next web project you've been thinking about. Are you looking to get in and out quick without thinking too 
too much about what your website should look like, bam, use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you. Or maybe more of a hands-on person, you've got lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly your site should look like. Squarespace gives you all the customization options you could ever want with no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. Once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, or maybe just messing around with the colors, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides so your website can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24 7 customer support. It's everything you could ever want all in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's gotta be with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash mega projects and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to it. The Olympics career began with its maiden voyage on the 14th of June 1911, sailing from Southampton to New York in just seven days. Just as the company was hoping, this journey was announced in newspapers all over Europe and North America, and more than 10,000 people came to the shore to watch its departure for the return trip. With the maiden voyage being a huge public success, she began regularly taking passengers back and forth between the continents without any problems. Well, there were no problems for about three months. In September of 1911, the Olympic crashed into the HMS Hawk, a British warship. The Olympic was fortunate enough to have no major damage or injuries, especially considering the fact that the Hawk had been designed to ram into other warships. The Hawk, though, was severely damaged, and the trial pronounced the Olympic responsible for the crash, and the subsequent repairs of the Hawk were therefore White Star Line's business. It's not exactly known what caused the crash, but the theory proposed during the trial was that Olympic displaced an immense amount of water as she moved near the Hawk, which disturbed her course and pulled her into the Olympic. The Hawk was eventually repaired and returned to duty. It was eventually sunk in World War I by a German submarine. Being rammed by a warship and emerging with easily repairable damage strengthened the opinion that the Olympic and the Titanic were unsinkable, which was unfortunately proven to be completely wrong when the Titanic sank just a year later. When the Titanic sank, the Olympic was trailing behind at a distance of about 120 miles or 190 kilometers. After the rescue missions were finished picking up the survivors, the Olympic offered to help transport them back to shore, but the other ships decided it would be best if the survivors didn't get plucked out of the water just to be traumatized again by boarding an identical version of the ship that had just sunk. Learning from the loss of the Titanic, the Olympic increased its number of lifeboats and tested its watertight compartments. The Olympic was also used by crash investigators to determine how quickly the Titanic would have turned and where it would likely have struck the iceberg. There are also several modern-day conspiracy theories about the sinking of the Titanic, such as a mummy's curse and attempted murder, but one of the theories actually involves the Olympic. Conspiracy theorists claim that the Olympic and Titanic were swapped prior to the trip, and the Olympic was actually the one that went down that day, intentionally for that matter, because it was too damaged from its earlier collision with the Hawk to continue service. Staging destruction by an iceberg would at least grant the company some insurance money. It's an interesting theory for sure, but there's really no evidence to back it up, which is why it's a conspiracy theory. Soon after the sinking of the Titanic, just before departing from Southampton, almost 300 of the Olympic's workers went on strike out of fear that the new lifeboats added in the wake of the Titanic disaster weren't seaworthy and couldn't be trusted to save the crew. An inspection of the lifeboats showed that they were rotten and couldn't even be opened, though executives at White Star Line claimed that they had been passed by the board of the trade inspector who found no issues with them. The company refused to comply with the workers' demands of new wooden lifeboats. Following this, more than 50 of the workers quit and returned to shore, where they were apprehended and charged with mutiny. Fortunately, they were all released without a fine and were allowed to return to work, likely out of fear that the public would take their side if the scandal got to the press. In autumn of 1912, about six months after the sinking of the Titanic, White Star Line pulled the Olympic out of the water and made some improvements. They added 48 lifeboats that were actually working this time, added more watertight compartments in the hull, and strengthened the entire front of the ship so that it could survive an impact similar to what sank the Titanic. At the same time, more cabins and a new restaurant were added, and when the renovations were completed, the Olympic was now more than 100 tons heavier than the Titanic originally was. Once she was placed back in the water, the Olympic resumed her trips as normal for the next year or so, until the beginning of World War I in 1914. 
in 1914. During the war, many civilian ships were adapted for wartime use, such as the other remaining Olympic-class vessel, the Britannic, who had been converted into a hospital ship. But the Olympic remained a commercial ship, mainly transporting Americans that were eager to get out of a Europe that was suddenly at war. But as the threat of German U-boats increased, fewer and fewer people were buying tickets to cross the ocean, and White Star Line decided to pull the Olympic from commercial service. During its last trip with passengers, it received a distress call from the HMS Audacious, who had hit a mine and was starting to sink. The Olympic and another vessel, the HMS Liverpool, were able to evacuate all of the sailors once it was determined that the ship could not be saved. After the rescue, White Star Line decided that they didn't want to risk losing the Olympic, so they announced their intentions to keep it grounded until the end of the war. The next year, however, she was commandeered by the Royal Navy, who converted her into a troop ship. Stripping the deck, they lined the Olympic with guns for self-defense, reinforced the hull, and made room for up to 6,000 soldiers on the ship. Throughout the war, her consistency earned her the nickname Old Reliable. While on a routine transport voyage to Greece, the Olympic spotted lifeboats and stopped to pick up the survivors. The lifeboats were from Provincia, a French ship that had just been sunk by U-boats. The captain of the Olympic was criticized in England for his actions to save the French sailors, as when the Olympic stopped in the water, it was a sitting duck for U-boats. The French vice admiral, on the other hand, was grateful for the rescue and awarded the captain a medal. Nearing the end of the war, in 1918, the Olympic was transporting American troops to the coast of France when it spotted a U-boat close by. The gunners immediately trained their weapons on it, and the Olympic turned and rammed the U-boat, causing the German submarine crew to abandon ship. The Olympic didn't stick around to pick up the survivors and continued on its journey. Later, it was revealed that the U-boat was preparing to torpedo the Olympic and was interrupted when it was spotted. By the time the war was over, the Olympic had burned through almost 350,000 tons of coal and carried over 200,000 men in the service of her country. After the war, she was given back to her owners, who remodeled her once again for civilian use. Engine technology had improved significantly during World War I, and the Olympic swapped out its old coal-burning rooms for oil burning ones. These not only had the benefit of improved fuel efficiency, but also reduced the number of engine crew from 350 to 60 and made the refueling process a matter of hours instead of a matter of days. During renovations, a suspicious dent was found on the hull of the boat, which historian Mark Chansai deduced was an impact from a torpedo that failed to detonate, likely launched from U-boat U-53, which spent a lot of time in the English Channel in 1918. The Olympic returned to transporting passengers across the Atlantic, and in 1925, a dance floor was added for class passengers, and with this and other luxuries, the ship even hosted some famous figures such as Charlie Chaplin, Marie Curie, and the British royal family. Throughout the 1920s, the Olympic was carrying tens of thousands of passengers per year, but this all started going downhill in the 1930s. The Great Depression dealt heavy blows to the Olympic. With money scarce, fewer people were traveling, and those who continued to travel preferred faster, newer ships that were built after World War I. With numbers declining every year, the Olympic continued to sail its routes, reaching an all-time low in 1934, when the total number of passengers for the whole year was a little more than 9,000. The list of reasons to retire the Olympic was just growing longer and longer, with every money-losing voyage. The final straw was when the Olympic collided with another ship. It was a much smaller light ship, a boat used to guide larger ships into a harbor. Coming into New York in thick fogs, the Olympic was trying to follow a radio beacon when it turned at the wrong time, plowing straight into Nantucket light ship LV-117. The Olympic tore straight through the smaller craft and cut it nearly in half, sinking it almost immediately. Seven men were killed in the accident and four more were injured. The Olympic was pulled from the water the following spring. She was sold to a member of parliament for £97,000, which is about £7 million in today's money. Dismantling and scrapping it took nearly two years, and today all that remains of the ship is some furniture and wood panels that have been installed on newer cruise liners in memory of the Olympic. By the end of her career, she had crossed the Atlantic 514 times, carried more than 400,000 passengers, and sailed almost 2 million miles. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.